quite a few speakers up here. For those who've been to our annual conference before, uh, last year was the first time we had our entire medical advisory board participate, and it really was a very worthwhile experience for the patients. It gave our medical advisory board a chance to interact with all of you and get a feel for some of your concerns. So we've brought them back for a second time, and I expect we're going to have them back next year as well and every year after, because these are the medical experts in the field who understand myositis better than anyone. Many of them are, are involved in research, and most of them see many myositis patients. And so you know there are very few doctors in America who can say that. Uh, but beyond that, they are truly the ones who are concerned and focused on this disease. Uh, so you understand our, the Medical Advisory Board of the Myositis Association is an independent group. Uh, they are the ones who decide and recommend to our board of directors what research in the field that they consider is worth funding. Our board of directors ultimately makes a decision, but really we rely on them for advice regarding uh, medical issues and particularly complex research, as you're about to, to hear about in, in a few minutes. Uh, there are 20 members of the Medical Advisory Board. Four of them were not able to be here with us for the conference this year, but the other 16 are here to tell you a little bit about their interest in myositis. They each have been asked just to speak for three, or five, three to five minutes. Uh, there are a couple who have substantial research to report on. They're probably going to talk a little bit longer, maybe 10 minutes. Uh, but e each one of them is going to be asked to come up, tell you how they got interested in myositis, tell you what they're doing, where their area of interest is, if there's any research that they're involved in or will be uh, in the future. So with that, I'm just going to, we're going to go down the, uh, the aisle here, down the table, and uh, I'm going to ask Brian Feldman, to in, and I'm going to ask each one of them to introduce themselves as well. I don't want to spend time introducing them. So, Brian. Thank you, Bob. So um, uh, my name is uh, Brian Feldman. I'm from the Hospital for Sick Children. I'm a pediatric rheumatologist, Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, uh, Canada. Uh, can we get the slides up there? Sure. Okay. So. Um, I've been running the uh, myositis clinic at the Hospital for Sick Children, uh, started in 1991, so we've had uh, a fair amount of uh, time to meet lots of patients with juvenile dermatomyositis and other forms of juvenile myositis, and the research programs that we put together are largely based on the experience that <clears throat> we've developed with those patients over the uh, 20 years. I do have a slide that uh, goes through some of the uh, current research projects that we're working on now. Um, but we don't need the slide. Um, we're involved uh, in many collaborative studies, the most important of which is a North American-wide uh, collaboration with other pediatricians, pediatric rheumatologists, um, in a group that's called a CARA. And CARA is the Childhood Arthritis and Rheumatology Research Alliance. In CARA, there's a large uh, myositis uh, group of physicians interested in almost uh, almost 200 centers across North America. What we've done over the um, last few years is develop some standardized treatment protocols so that we can learn best which treatments are most effective for juvenile dermatomyositis and other childhood myositis. The model that we're using comes from the uh, oncology groups, the cancer groups for children that started to do this in the 70s. And starting with uniformly fatal diseases, like leukemia in the 1970s had a 100% death rate, they've now got over a 90% cure rate by doing the exact same uh, things that we're trying to emulate now across North America with the CARA group. Um, you can see on the slide there, there's a, a number of other things that we're doing. I have a bunch of uh, my PhD students and uh, fellows looking at uh, different clinical features to better understand just how, as we get more and more patients, just how childhood myositis uh, can present and what can go wrong with people so we can figure out how to fix it. Um, we have a number of treatment studies that uh, we published and are publishing, including uh, intravenous immunoglobulin. We're very interested in how different people respond to methotrexate. Methotrexate is very widely used in childhood myositis, and there's likely genetic reasons why some people have more side effects or fewer, <clears throat> and some genetic reasons why some people respond better uh, than others. 
And so we uh, have a study now looking at the genes that are involved in predicting who responds and who doesn't with methotrexate. Um, we're very interested also in exercise and exercise therapy and how exercise affects the muscles if you have myositis and how exercise can be used as a treatment for myositis to uh, make people better and more functional. And uh, there's a group that's been formed, it's an international group. Uh, I didn't coin the uh, acronym, but it's called McCade. It's like a, a Dutch group uh, decided that that was a good way to uh, call our group. But the McCade group is um, trying to develop protocols that we can use to uh, train children with myositis using exercise to see uh, most, the most functional improvement. Um, there's a number of other studies that we're doing, but we have only a very limited time here to discuss. So I think I'll turn the podium over now to uh, Dr. Huber. Thanks, Brian. Um, I'm Adam Huber. I am a pediatric rheumatologist uh, in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia, Canada. So those of you who don't know where that is, it's on the far east coast of Canada. Um, I actually trained in Toronto with Brian, and I hopefully took most of what he uh, taught me and have used. I'm involved in a variety of things. Uh, Brian spoke briefly about uh, the CARA initiative, which is looking at developing treatment plans and then comparing them um, in a basically very practical as physicians treat patients uh, sort of way. Um, so I've been intimately involved in that group um, and I'm actually the vice chair of the JDM uh, group in CARA. And we actually are hopefully gonna be publishing in the next month or two uh, those treatment plans, so they'll be actually be available uh, more generally. Um, my research also uh, looks at outcomes and um, how we assess children who have myositis. Um, all of you in the room understand how complex these diseases can be, and so figuring out the best ways and validating those tools that we use um, is extremely important, both from understanding how people are doing and also looking at clinical trials, which I think you'll be hearing a little bit more about later this morning. Um, the last thing I'm working on currently is um, working with some people at the NIH uh, looking at predictors of mortality in juvenile dermatomyositis, um, which is not common, but certainly um, very important. And um, I, can, I think I can say that I find myositis to be um, extremely fascinating from an intellectual point of view, um, but also a very difficult disorder for the families I deal with. Um, and so I think it's really important the work that the uh, Myositis Association is doing. Thank you. Uh, I'm Todd Levine. I spoke to some of you, I think, just a little while ago. I'm a neurologist out of Phoenix, Arizona. I'm doing a number of different things with myositis. I talked a little bit about the uh, Novartis trial that's beginning in IBM, but um, one of the <coughs> more interesting projects I've been working on for the last year relates to um, IVIG use. And I was just going to do, actually, by show of hands, how many people in the room have gotten IVIG? Yeah, that's a pretty good number. So if I were to guess, I'd say about 40, 30 or 40. And if I were to guess, I would say that you probably got it in 20 or 30 different ways. Um, and, and the reason for that is that, number one, IVIG is not approved uh, for myositis. And number two, there really are no standard protocols um, in terms of, of how we approach this. And it's, it's a huge problem for practicing physicians. It's also a really huge problem for um, the, the economy of healthcare. So the estimates are that there's 47 million grams of IVIG that's gonna be given next year in 2012, um, which is probably somewhere around six to eight billion dollars. Um, and there's just absolutely no understanding of what's being done with that drug. So we've begun an initiative uh, to really start to collect uh, that data. And so what we're gonna do is across the country just try to enroll patients um, who are receiving IVIG, just exactly as it's prescribed by their doctors, to get an understanding of the different ways in which it's being uh, dosed, to try to get an understanding of what diagnoses it's being used for. Uh, there's lots of different brands of IVIG, and then try to get a sense of um, whether the outcomes seem to matter and what other medications you're on. So the hope will be in a couple of years to have collected the data on thousands and thousands of patients and then it makes some headway in terms of saying, okay, let's start to try to design trials and come up with protocols that actually can be a little bit data-driven. So that's been probably the largest project that I've been working on. So, and I'll pass it over to Alan. <clears throat> my, my name is Alan Pestrunk. I'm at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, uh, 
I'm a, a, a clinical neurologist and also a, a muscle and nerve neuropathologist, and a lot of what I'm interested in is based on um, the, what I do on Saturday mornings, which is I go in, 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 into the hospital and sit in the dark room and, and, and look at uh, muscle, muscle biopsies that have been done that week and possibly before under the microscope and try to use muscle biopsies to make um, diagnoses. And um, my, uh, one of my major projects over the last few years has been to try to um, look at muscle biopsies from patients with immune and inflammatory myopathies in a way um, that will allow doctors to make better decisions about how to treat you. Um, in, in particular for patients with inclusion body myositis-like disorders to try to use muscle biopsies in, in, in ways that make that diagnosis more accurately so doctors know who has that disease and so you shouldn't be exposed to certain drugs and who doesn't have that disease so you should be um, tried aggressively on different um, immun immunomodulating uh, uh, me medications. And uh, so uh, the, the culmination of what we've been doing over the last 20 years is that um, we believe that there are, there's now a, a scheme for doctors to look at, at, at muscle biopsies and, and uh, in, in a way that will give um, the, the clinical doctors taking care of patients a lot more information about what's likely to happen to patients and, and, and what therapies are likely to work and, and, and not work. Um, a, a, a second uh, um, area that I'm specifically interested in in terms of the pathology of, 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 of muscle disease is, is uh, uh, one type of disease, the, the juvenile dermatomyositis, where we're um, trying to study uh, what's I I important in causing the, 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 the juvenile dermatomyositis muscle damage, and it's our our theory, as it's probably been for a hundred years, that it's, it's uh, vessel damage that, that ends up causing uh, muscle to, to be damaged secondarily, and we're trying to understand um, how that happens. And the, the third area that we're particularly interested in is a little bit complementary to what Todd was talking about, and that, that is that, that um, we, we believe that the medications we already have can be used, used more safely, and in particular, um, we've been, been studying uh, ways to give corticosteroids to patients um, that, that, are, that are safer than the common ways that, in which they're given. In other words, usually corticosteroids are given um, every day or every other day, and there's a significant um, number of side effects that happen with that, and we believe that in quite a number of patients, you can give corticosteroids intermittently either twice a week or once a week or every other week, and the result of that uh, can be in some patients that, that that's equally efficacious, but there are many fewer side effects, and so that's another area that, that, that uh, we're interested in, not in terms of muscle pathology, but in terms of the clinical care of patients. And so I think that's a summary of what I do. And, um, Thank you, Ellen. My name is Steve Yetterberg. I'm a simple clinical rheumatologist at Mayo Clinic. In a former life, I did things in the laboratory, which is actually how I got my interest in myositis a couple of decades ago. But at the moment, I'm going to just tell you about three things um, related to uh, my practice and patients that I see. One that we've tried to do at the clinic is to work to standardize some of the assessments and treatment plans for patients with myositis. It's been the observation that often patients are treated, I wouldn't say haphazard, certainly in, um, assessment and treatment has to be individualized, but we're looking at at least for our practice trying to standardize what we do. From a clinical research standpoint, we've had a fellow who's gotten an interest, actually she's moved on now to be working at the NIH, in cardiovascular disease. So she's looked at some of our patients trying to understand some of the cardiovascular risk factors and is finishing up a cohort study of patients seeing there looking at risk factors. And finally, I do things in basic research in association with my colleague Ann Reed, who still has, is doing basic research things, and she's trying to understand some of the immune mechanisms. So we collect samples and clinical data for her. And that is it. Keep under my time. Because Bob probably won't. And my
My name is Bob Wortman. I'm a clinical rheumatologist at Dartmouth Medical School and Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. It's in New Hampshire, if you didn't know where that is. Uh, and uh, I've had the pleasure of being on the board for uh, the full number of years you can be on the board. And this last year, I've had the honor of being the liaison for the medical advisory board to the board of directors. Um, my interest in muscle disease started uh, many years ago and initially was mostly involving research in which I was interested in why people with an inflammatory muscle disease actually got weak because the inflammatory cells aren't in every muscle and they, some people don't have many inflammatory cells and uh, so that's a question I started asking a, a long time ago and I don't know if the next speaker is going to tell you the answer to that <laughs> because in collaboration with him uh, he's done all the work, but we've actually got some new insight into that, which may lead to new approaches to therapy. Now, I've also been involved in some clinical trials, and uh, it's been a real pleasure working with this organization. I hope to continue to do so. My name is, uh, I think uh, some of you must be wondering how to pronounce this long name. So there is a trick. So it's, uh, people call me Raju, the last four letters, uh, and that's the easy way. <coughs> so uh, uh, what I, I'm an immunologist by training and uh, <coughs> trained uh, in Dr. Paul Plot's laboratory at the National Institutes of Health some 17 years back. And uh, uh, I went to his lab to study initially to, wanted to study rheumatoid arthritis, but he told me uh, for a basic scientist, myositis is the disease uh, to focus if you want to understand the mechanisms of the disease. So that advice helped me for the last 17 years. I focused my lab to study myositis at multiple levels. So I think you have to click them, I think. Oh, OK, good. Thank you. So as uh, Bob said, uh, uh, I'm interested in, oops, sorry. <laughs> studying how muscle damage occurs. So a majority of you know that there is inflammation and probably inflammation contributes to the damage. Some of the studies that uh, I did in collaboration with Bob Ortman clearly suggest that it is not uh, all uh, inflammation that is responsible for muscle weakness. So we found an enzyme uh, that is specifically expressed in skeletal muscle that contributes to the weakness. So there are ongoing experiments to figure out is there uh, uh, a drug that can be used to upregulate this particular enzyme. I'm also interested, as you saw, m most of the time for this group of diseases, uh, uh, pretty much whatever is being uh, uh, offered uh, at the clinic, they're borrowed from some other disease. Okay, it worked in rheumatoid arthritis, let's try in myositis. So this, there is a fundamental problem because these are uh, completely different disease entities. So one of the things that my lab is focusing on is developing drugs by testing them in the animal models, specifically for myositis. So the third project, uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, how the gene and the environment uh, interact. So this is the project that uh, just got funded uh, by the Myositis Association uh, in collaboration with Dr. Fred Miller at NIH. So I will briefly up give you an update uh, on the, uh, the rationale for the study and what we are doing with the study. I also mentioned that uh, I work on the animal models, the, and many times people say that, uh, oh, yeah, almost uh, uh, every disease is cured in animals, but it never gets translated into humans. So 
uh, one of the primary things uh, I focus currently is to do the standardized evaluation method so that we can have predictable results in uh, people when the drugs enter into human clinical trials. So for the next uh, five, six minutes or so, uh, I'll talk a little bit about this new project. And I have to thank Dr. Fred Miller, who has kindly given some of the uh, slides. Uh, he's one of the leaders uh, uh, on the environmental exposure and the triggers for myositis. So uh, this project has two components. One is studying in the, the exposure issues, and the second is molecular mechanism that uh, uh, I do at my laboratory. So if you look at the things that cause uh, myositis, there are quite a few. So you can see a lot of infectious agents, viruses, some bacteria. So, and also if you look at the whole list of non-infectious agents, for example, starting from drugs to biologics, some of the foods that we take, and uh, occupational exposures, and uh, 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 I think uh, in the, the last uh, portion you can clearly see the stress, as well as UV exposure are some of the things uh, uh, that people have uh, at least uh, propose to cause myositis. So one thing that you can take from this long list is, is that several things can give rise to this particular disease phenotype. So, but some are much more co correlated with the disease rather than the others. So one in particular is the UV exposure. So if you look at the UV, I think it is the September 17th, so you can, these days you can see quite a bit uh, uh, how the UV uh, rays are in terms of its uh, index around the country. So obviously you notice the, the red uh, meaning uh, quite a heavy uh, uh, index as compared to the green. So uh, what uh, uh, <coughs> Dr. Fred Miller did is he wanted to uh, look at uh, whether the disease, especially the dermatomyositis, correlates with the UV uh, uh, index. So this particular study, as you can see, the, I showed only the US locations, but the, this one uh, uh, all around, there are, I think, 15 different countries in the world. You can clearly see if the, the exposure directly correlate with the percentage of dermatomyositis. Uh, uh, in the uh, population. And, uh, and if you take that to the US, and again, uh, you can see southwest and southeastern part of the United States uh, uh, have a high uh, 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 DM uh, prevalence. So that correlates with what I showed you in the map of the UV uh, uh, index. So, uh, and also uh, he studied uh, quite elegantly that uh, uh, people developing uh, disease in certain seasons, the onset of the disease. And so in general, there is nothing that uh, PM comes in summer or uh, DM comes in uh, winter, no. But what, what uh, he found is in fact, uh, subsets of the disease are highly correlated. Uh, with the immunological phenotype. For example, in this case, the onset uh, peaks in men with PM between March and April, whereas uh, the onset peaks in June and July for women with uh, DM. So this is very uh, uh, interesting. But the main question is, uh, there are not many systematic studies. So the Myositis Association funded study uh, Dr. Miller is focusing on uh, 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 a, a group of uh, uh, people, essentially a, a subset, uh, the, the military personnel. So there is some evidence that there is increasing incidence of myositis in military uh, uh, personnel. And then this particular study essentially catalogs uh, almost all their exposures and try to correlate in a systematic fashion over the next uh, uh, four to five years and come up with uh, the, uh, the list of triggers uh, in this population. 
So uh, the, my part of the study is, OK, we, we know what are the triggers. What exactly these triggers do to the, uh, the genome and to the immune system? So as I mentioned, that there is no single cause for myositis. If you take the muscle biopsy and try to look for a cause, you will never find it because there are people tried because the, the most of the inciting agents, they come, they modify the genome, and the immune system eliminates them. Therefore, you will never find the inciting agent at the tissue. So there is a substantial evidence that, uh, in fact, that's the case. I showed, you don't have to read them, I think uh, the whole list of things, uh, the triggers, almost all of them are known to cause changes at the genome level. These are called so-called epigenetic modifications. These are not mutations themselves, but these are at the level of the uh, gene promoters. So what we proposed is that irrespective of what the triggering agent is, they're all unified at the level of genome uh, in making certain changes. And those changes, if they interact with the individual genetic component, you can uh, get different disease phenotypes. So what unifies these triggers is the epigenetic modifications that are occurring in the genome. So today, the technology permits us to look all 25,000 genes. Previously, this was not possible. So therefore, in an unbiased way, we can see what this particular uh, trigger did to our genome. So just to give you an example, you know, many of you uh, uh, took statins. And uh, what statin can do to the gene expression? So here is the, uh, some 30,000 genes plotted. Blue is decreased expression. Red is increased. Pre and post, you can see the entire uh, 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 spectrum of the change. Uh, almost all the genes that were low, they become very high. So one single drug can change close to several thousand genes. So the imp how this increase in the expression of these genes uh, interacts with the uh, genetic background of the individual is what uh, uh, we are focusing on. So essentially, my, my, my part of the study is to figure out the, at the whole genome level these epigenetic modifications and come up with the strategy how to uh, identify as well as therapeutically uh, interrogate, uh, so intervene uh, these mechanisms. So obviously, there are several challenges uh, to do these kind of studies there because uh, you know we are all uh, 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 are heterogeneous and uh, myositis uh, is a uh, rare disease, and so. Uh, it takes time to have logical conclusions to do uh, this kind of a large scale studies. But having said that, I think we have to start, and this is the time to start. The technology that we have really allows us to scan the entire genome and look at the specific changes at the individual <coughs> level. Thank Morning. Uh, my name is uh, Chet Otis. I'm from University of Pittsburgh. And just to tell you a little bit about, uh, I mean, I've been at Pitt for um, 24 years now. And, and I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the other things that we're, we're doing at Pitt, except that we've, got a long, we've had a long interest in, in myositis. And we've really, um, you know, from, from, from a personal standpoint, you know, I've, uh, I've, I've got a passion for the disease. Uh, having seen patients for the past 24 years with this disease, it's been, um, you know, it's something that really tugs at your heart after you see diseases and their different manifestations. And when you have success stories, and sometimes when you don't have success stories, they kind of contribute to the emotion that you have for the uh, particular disease. But one of the passions that we have is, is, of course, trying to make patients better through clinical trials. And what I thought I'd do this morning is kind of talk you through this, this large study that was done in adult and juvenile myositis. And it was called the REM study, rituximab and myositis. And 
So let me just take you back about 10 years because it's been a pretty dynamic 10, 10 to 20 years or, or, or one or two decades. So 10 years ago when a lot of the people around this table here were looking to um, create a clinical trial, we had a lot of problems with, with what was out there in myositis. There was a lack of consistent design. There were, there were a whole bunch of myositis trials and uh, they were small. So that if you look at the problems up there, I'm not gonna go through every bullet there, but basically when you've got a lot of small trials and, and there are issues with who gets into a trial and how that trial is designed and what other types of therapies are, are patients allowed to have, then you can understand how you can really kind of create a quagmire in terms of what's out there. So then I'm going to kind of take you through the last decade and, and, and what happened. And uh, uh, as I was telling, or we were talking about last night, there was a, a group of like-minded individuals that uh, kind of got together. And that group was called IMAX. And you can see there, it's the International Myositis Asse Assessment and Clinical Studies Group. It's a coalition of, uh, coalition of people that are interested uh, in, in this particular disease. And the goal was to improve the lives of children and adults with, with myositis, you know, through a lot of different ways, one of them which included discovering better therapies. And, uh, you know, Vegas has the Jersey boys, but we've got the myositis girls and boys, and uh, these, these were three people that were really pivotal in, in looking at putting this coalition together, and that's Fred Miller up on the left and Lisa Ryder and Dave Eisenberg, and they've been kind of the, the, the driving force behind this group of, of individuals. So if you, look at the, if you look at it as a puzzle, now how did this thing, how was the puzzle put together to, to uh, complete this trial? And the first, as I said, was the establishment of this, of this group. Um, and again, multidisciplinary, neurologists, rheumatologists, adult and, and pediatric uh, uh, physicians. The second thing, if you're gonna do a trial, you have to be able to measure certain things in a trial. And those are called outcome measures. And, um, you know, the, uh, th these had to be agreed upon, and uh, Fred Miller, again, led this charge, and uh, we have a, a group of outcome measures. The next thing that you have to do is you have to look at those outcome measures, and you say, okay, what combination of these outcome measures are gonna be necessary to declare a patient as improved in a clinical trial? And that, again, was led by Lisa Ryder, whose picture you saw up there earlier. And then finally we had to decide, okay, how are you gonna do these trials? You know, what are the, what are the guidelines that once you, you know, have a group of people and you, you got a group of patients identified, you know, how are you gonna put it together? How are you gonna create a trial that's, that's the right kind of trial that will answer some questions that are very important? So then there was a paper on the consensus of clinical trial, consensus on uh, clinical trial guidelines for patients with myositis. And, and then finally, uh, what, kind of measures are you going to use to determine active disease versus damage? Because you can treat the heck out of a patient with muscle weakness, but if there's not a reversibility there, then you got problems. So we have to make sure that there's active disease. And, that, and, and uh, myositis you know, is more than just muscle disease. As most of us see in rheumatology and neurology, patients can have skin and cardiac and lung involvement. So it's, it's, it's a, a way to look at the activity of disease in many organ systems. So on this one slide is, you know, is, a, is a tremendous amount of work by a lot of different people. And the next thing that we had to decide several years ago was, okay, we've got this put together. Why do we want to use this particular drug? Why use rituximab in polymyositis and dermatomyositis? Well, at that point, that drug had been used for a lot of years in patients with lymphoma and had led to dramatic improvement in patients with what are called B-cell lymphomas and it had been used for many years in other autoimmune diseases, and the people around this table, like Drs. Pestronk and Levine, had used it in, in immunologically mediate, uh, mediated neurologic diseases, and, and indeed, Todd Levine, uh, right about that time, five years ago or so, uh, was part of our steering committee and had published uh, at, at, at that time an open-label uncontrolled pilot trial in, in seven adult refractory patients that were given this drug in, just like you give it for lymphoma. So here we had a trial, and this was funded by the National Institutes of Health, and the trial was termed, as, as you can see there, the rituximab and myositis, or the RIM study. And this study looked at adult PM, adult DM, and juvenile DM in the same trial, and there's 
pluses and minuses to that. I think we've experienced some minuses down the road as we've looked at the data. But I just want to just briefly tell you just what this um, trial uh, was, was really, um, what we really wanted it to do in terms of the innovative aspects. And I'll just show you, show you a little bit of the data. So if you look at this trial from the start, it's, it was a first prospective double-blind randomized trial in myositis that enrolled kids and adults. It was the first use of the randomized placebo phase design, and that was our, my good friend Brian Feldman here who was very responsible for that type of design, and we'll talk about that design in a minute. And then, as I said before, it was the first collaboration of pediatric and adult rheumatologists. We implemented those disease activity and damage measures, and then finally it was the first time that this published definition of improvement was used in a clinical trial. So those are the innovative features of this trial that was funded by the NIH. And the participating centers are starred all over the map there. And, and these are really the main myositis centers in the United States. And then we were fortunate enough to also have Ingrid Lundberg and Yuri Vinkowski uh, from Sweden and Czechoslovakia, respectively, as international sites. So this was a multi-center uh, international trial, as well as the people on my left here, Adam Huber and Brian Feldman from Canada. And the aim of the REM study was to look at the efficacy of this particular drug in refractory adult and juvenile myositis patients in a, a study that spanned approximately one year, 44 to 45 weeks. And our goal was 202 patients, 76 adult PM, 76 adult DM, and 50 kids with JDM. And just to, just to again summarize, it was, it was the largest center. We actually got 200 of the 200, we, we en enrolled 200 of the 202 plants. So it was a very, you know, it was a very good study. It took a few years to get that cranked up, but uh, we, we, we did enroll essentially our target. It involved 14 different visits over a period of 44 weeks. And the initial uh, results were actually reported uh, less than a year ago at our, at our national meeting. Now, I know you guys may not want to look at a, a, a slide like this, and it's a little confusing, but I just thought I'd mention to you how we did this particular trial. Um, and it's basically called the design of the trial. And as you can see, uh, the key thing in this, in this picture here is that there are half the patients that got drug early, and there are half the patients that got this drug later. So you can see, if, and I don't have a, a point or anything here, but basically you can see that rituximab, although it is given in a standard fashion once weekly, we gave it two higher doses one week apart. So patients in the earlier group got rituximab week zero one, patients in the later group got rituximab basically two months later at weeks eight and nine. And you're gonna say, well, and, and you know, everybody got drugs, so how do you tell here what the, what the uh, real efficacy of the drug is? And indeed, uh, suffice to say, we struggled with the accurate, uh, the, the, the ability of, of the design to really answer the question that we wanted it to answer. But the bottom line is here that the primary endpoint, that's what we look at in clinical trials, called the primary endpoint, was to see, is to compare how long it takes for the group group that got drug early compared to the group that got drug later on, eight weeks later. And the, and the hypothesis was that the early group gets better, meets that DOI, that definition of, of improvement, sooner than the group that gets uh, the drug later on. Well, overall, uh, you know, I'm not going to show you all the different curves and the, and the uh, statistical things that we uh, have struggled with over the past six months, looking at every way that you can. But the, the data quality right off the bat was very good. There was very low patient dropout. You know, five patients basically had a baseline visit and didn't appropriately follow up, so you couldn't include them. So 195 patients of the randomized patients actually were included in the analysis, which is quite good. So the, the uh, quality of the data was excellent, and there was very little missing data. And you want to know if the drug works, and basically, to, if you look at the upper curve there, you'll see that these are what are called B cells. Now, some of you have been in some sessions today where you learn about B cells, but the bottom line is that B cells, which are depleted by that drug, are actually immune little immune factories, okay, and they can release certain things called cytokines, and they can make those autoantibodies that you may have heard about. And the bottom line is that they're an immunologic target, okay, if you will. 
and the drug worked. It depleted everybody because the one that got the, the, the group that got it later, the red group, the late group, again depleted their cells, much like you would expect eight weeks after the other group. So what is a summary? Well, I didn't talk to you about the primary or the secondary endpoints, but the primary endpoint actually, we, we say we, uh, when in, in medicine, the primary endpoint was not met. In other words, there was not a statistical difference in the timing of the definition of response in the early and the late group. So that was very disappointing, and in fact, the secondary endpoints, which I didn't talk about and I figured we wouldn't have time, were not achieved in the RIM study um, as, as well. So I, I don't want to stop right there, because if I did, you'd probably start throwing things at me, because your tax dollars went into this uh, $8 million trial. But what we did find during this uh, trial is that if you look at the red block and you look at the, or the, the uh, blue block and the, and the red block, that is the percentage of patients in each one of those two arms, 100 or so in, in each one. And those are the percent of patients that actually did meet the definition of improvement in this trial. So although the design of the trial was flawed, and, and uh, you know, somebody has to take the hit for that, and, uh, and, you're, and you're listening to them. So although the design of the trial was flawed, 83% of the patients that were enrolled in this trial actually met the definition of improvement. So we had some what, what's called discordance here. We had a, a design that didn't work, we had a few things that didn't work, but we had some other uh, beneficial things. And the other thing that you, know, you all know about prednisone, and you all know that uh, we don't want to be on prednisone, we don't want our patients on prednisone, and, and that can be an issue for us. So there actually was a statistical improvement, or a drop, I should say, in the amount of prednisone that was necessary from beginning to end of the trial. Again, which supports the fact that if you're able to, what we call, spare the dose of prednisone, then that's a good thing for patients. So point number two was that this, this uh, trial showed a steroid sparing effect. And then the third thing was that built into the trial, we had a, what's called a retreatment arm. That is, if you responded to the drug, got worse, met a definition of worsening, you again, if you met certain criteria, were, were allowed to be retreated with the drug. And we expected about 20 to be uh, retreated, and, and actually only 10 were, um, I'm sorry, nine were retreated, there were 10 that, would, that uh, met eligibility. And of those nine that were retreated, eight of the nine actually met the definition of improvement again. So, you know, we've got, you know, some points there, basically, if you summarize the RIM study, the primary and secondary endpoints were not met. 83% of the refractory group, now this is a refractory group of patients. This is patients that had failed steroids and had failed one other immunosuppressive medication. So, you know, they're pretty sick with their disease. The third thing was that there was that steroid sparing effect. The fourth was that retreated patients improved. And, okay, I'm done. <laughs> and uh, just to acknowledge all of the sites here, you know, uh, there's, you know, the, from, from uh, NIAMS to, to all of the sites that were involved, um, I just wanted to acknowledge the people that were uh, a tremendous part of it, many of them sitting at this table here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Christopher Stein. I'm the co-director of the Johns Hopkins Myositis Center. I always say it feels like coming home to family when I come to this conference. And as my family, I'll share with you why I'm not standing at that podium. I'm going to sit. I'm going to give you a one second antidote, or maybe a minute antidote. Those of you who spoke with me this morning in the polymyositis session know I, I know the story. So I woke this morning at 5.30 um, with the back of my throat, the little dangly thing that goes down there called the uvula, was swollen the entire side of my throat. Um, so I couldn't swallow and had to call emergency services. And so, and, but I, I would like to say I made my talk, um, but they told me to uh, relax, drink a lot, and they said that they did had one uh, cure for me. They didn't know if I could get some of my hands on it, but it was steroids. I, <laughs> I told them I thought I knew where I might be able to find some. So, so forgive me, I'm going to sit. Um, I got interested in myositis um, as a rheumatologist. I'm a trained rheumatologist. I initially became interested in rheumatic disease and working in lupus, and I was very fascinated with the complex nature of rheumatologic diseases. Eventually, what I learned through my mentors in the lupus world was how important it was to follow a cohort of patients with rare diseases and follow them forward, because you can see patterns emerge 
when you can't normally see them in just a few patients, you start to see a larger, broader pattern when you look at a lot of patients. And so when I moved to the myositis world, I did the same thing. And it's through our clinic, which is multidisciplinary. I work with a neurologist, a pulmonologist, uh, physical medicine, rehabilitation, PT, physical therapy. We have a multidisciplinary approach. And I think it's through that approach, I've, I've said this before, we finally stopped arguing and started talking. And when you talk to colleagues that think differently than you, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> I think that you get a, a greater picture for, for these diseases. So I've spent, I'm, I'm a clinician by training, but I'm also a clinician scientist, I'm, uh, and I do clinical research about 65% of my time, and 35% of the time I spend in clinic. During the course of the last four years since the myositis center opened, and years before that, so I've been doing this just um, going on 11 years, I have an interest in a few things. The main things for me are um, something called autoantibodies and why our bodies um, react to themselves. In the course of seeing a lot of patients, um, we, our group um, that I work with recently discovered that statins, which you heard Dr. Raju tell you a little about, we know that statins, which are cholesterol-lowering medications, can cause muscle, they're, they're great drugs, but they can also cause muscle injury. And the traditional way of thinking about that was that they caused a toxic muscle injury directly to the muscle. But then I heard the story over and over again, and oh, there's a famous guy at Johns Hopkins named William Osler who says the patient will tell you the diagnosis. Uh, and I'll tell you this is so true. Several times a patient had said to me, um, um, <clears throat> I know it was the statin. I'm telling you it was the statin. And we'd say, no, you took the drug away and you're getting worse. It can't be the statin. I'm here to tell you, in many cases, it was the statin. So we noticed that there are some people that develop an autoimmune um, version uh, of myopathy when exposed to a statin. That's the much rarer version. Most people take it, have some, may, have, may, or not, may or may not have some problem with their muscle, and it goes away when they stop the drug. But I think that it changes paradigms when we start looking for unique patterns, so that's something I do. I also have an interest um, in MRI and how MRI may or may not be able to tell us different patterns of diseases. Those of you in the polymyositis session with me, I joke that I think your tag should say PM question mark, because I think that there are several people um, that get diagnosed with this disease that m that diagnosis gets overutilized, that absolutely is applicable in many cases. But I think it's important that we're careful about how we label or classify these diseases so that when it comes to clinical trials, we put the right people in the right trials. I have an interest in clinical trials. I do a few at, at the center, and I'm hoping within a year I can report to you that we are now starting to expand, finally, I'm hoping, to inclusion body myositis, so we'll stay tuned for that. The final thing, uh, and there are many more, but I think the final thing I'd like to emphasize is that um, along with um, Ingrid, actually, um, heading from Sweden, um, and then uh, Dr. Song, an investigator from Korea, we are starting an international um, effort, which will be in conjunction with IMAX, which Dr. Otis spoke about. So, uh, there's something called OMERACT, which is outcome measures originally developed for rheumatoid arthritis, but it's been expanded to many of the rheumatologic diseases. M one of the initiatives that I would, I'm taking on as a special interest is patient reported outcomes. Although in clinical trials, <coughs> we do um, look at outcomes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I cannot drink any more water. Uh, thank you. We, uh, we look at outcomes, we look at um, patient-reported outcomes in the broadest sense, quality of life indicators that aren't meant just for myositis. So in the near future, we'll start doing patient focus groups and finally asking you, as the patient, what matters. I'm sure it matters that you get stronger, but maybe even though you've gotten stronger, you have issues with depression, sexual function, things that we don't talk about in clinical trials, and I think it's very important that we ask the patient. So in the near future, I hope to report to you that we are starting a patient-reported outcome initiatives where you will help us to determine the outcome measures to be used alongside clinical measures in clinical trials. And thanks for bearing with me. Thank you, Lisa. You're a true warrior. Uh, next person is Jerry Mendel. He's the chair of the Medical Advisory Board. He's going to talk about the gene therapy trial that's 
that's about to get underway related to IBM. I know there's a lot of questions. We want to hold the questions till the very end so all, all the members of the Medical Advisory Board have a chance to speak. We will have time at the end for questions, so here's Jerry. Thank you. I don't know why I didn't get to introduce myself. Um, <laughs> everybody else did? <laughs> no, I'm kidding you. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here and to serve this um, this uh, association. Um, my history goes back to 1969 when I first went to NIH uh, to study muscle disease and has continued since that time. Um, as most of you know and many of you have helped with, and I'll, I'll make a point about that, is we're trying to uh, focus um, some, some particular effort on inclusion body myositis. And the um, yeah, there we go. I hope. Maybe I'm going the wrong way. So. No? Can you help me here? I see. I, I pushed their four arrows up here and I picked the wrong three. There we go. So the problem in myositis, as most of you know, <coughs> is that um, mm, I'm not doing well, is that there is, yeah, there we go, is that there is thigh muscle weakness that really uh, is very prohibitive and causes loss of uh, ambulation uh, over time and frequent falls. And we have targeted from the beginning when we were funded by the Myositis Association a way of trying to increase the strength of the thigh muscle. And one of the ways um, that uh, we know about is to use um, uh, a, an approach where we interrupt the myostatin pathway. And just very briefly, the myostatin circulates in the blood and is cleaved and, form, and, uh, and has a ligand um, with the receptor in the muscle. And this keeps the muscle in check in turn, so it, it doesn't really change in size unless there's injury or when there's uh, in, in early development. But um, there is uh, ways of inhibiting the myostatin pathway, and one of the ways that we're using is folostatin. It's a peptide. Now, how do you deliver this? Um, and we deliver this with a virus. I'm the head of the Gene Therapy Center at Ohio State University and Nationwide Children's Hospital. And one of the ways that we can deliver um, folostatin is to put it is to put it into. Uh, I'm not doing well with this machine here, um, is to put it into a virus, and I have shown down here, and, um, and, the, and we deposit it in the muscle, and the muscle secretes um, folostatin to block it before it gets to the muscle, and the consequence is that we can increase the size of the muscle. So that's our goal. Now, um, for the last Four years we've been working on uh, bringing this to, uh, to clinical trial, and there are multiple, multiple steps involved. But one of the ones, one of the steps I'm most grateful to, um, to the participants here today is that we were able to do an outcome study. And outcomes have been said by every single investigator who came up here today. And outcomes are critical to us when we, when we plan a clinical trial, we have to be measuring the right thing. And that can be very difficult. And when we're doing a clinical trial um, and in, to increase thigh muscle strength, the FDA says to us, we're not really interested in strength, we're interested in does your strength in the thigh muscle actually predict a functional change. And thanks to 85 patients, many of whom are in this audience who came and were screened for the uh, clinical trial, we were able to, to uh, look at this in detail. And what we asked was, does quadriceps strength uh, correlate with uh, the distance walked either in the two minute or six minute walk test? And, uh, and can we predict accurately function by increasing quadriceps muscle strength? The answer to that question is using quantitative muscle strength, which ma many of you uh, uh, exposed yourself to or participated in, um, which is not that easy. Um, we measured quad strength 
um, in, by a specific transducer, and this is called uh, maximum voluntary isometric contraction. In any case, um, what we found is that the quadriceps muscle strength specifically does correlate with both the distance walked and the two-minute walk test. Uh, some patients can't walk more than that, and other patients can walk six minutes, and it has a high degree of correlation with both six-minute and two-minute walk tests. And this will help us tremendously as we move toward this clinical trial. And I really extend my great thanks to you uh, who participated in this. We also looked at other measures, and I won't detail these here, but other measures including a functional rating scale, walking upstairs, stair, uh, getting out of chairs, all had a correlation with strength. And so when we go back to the FDA and say that we increase quadriceps muscle strength, we have definite and clear evidence that that predicts a change in function. So that is extremely important, and again, I'm grateful for your participation. Now, the major milestone, I've been asked this at least hundreds of times, is that when are we going to start this clinical trial? And, um, and you'll see why this took so long. Here is, here's the document that we submitted to the FDA this past week. This is 2,035 pages. Um, it's a document that stands eight inches tall. And um, here is another picture of it that I took myself um, as, we, as we put it in the FedEx box and it was delivered to the FDA. So when the FDA now approves of this, and this could be as early as the next 30 days, we should be able to start the clinical trial. That's the definitive answer that many of you have been asking. So we're really on the way of getting this, uh, getting this trial started. Now, I'll just mention about how we're doing the trial um, and I, I've shown this slide here before, but it's important. What we did in the non-human primate is inject the thigh muscle um, in three sites. What we're going to be doing in patients, because monkeys are, monkeys are obviously much smaller than humans, but the muscle comp uh, structure um, and innervation is very much the same. It's the closest we can come to simulating a clinical trial. But in patients, we're going to be injecting the thigh muscle at, uh, at four, on four different rows along the, the uh, three different sites at four different rows along the thigh muscle. And what we hope to produce is the same thing we did in the monkey, which is very, uh, in, very increased size and strength of the thigh muscle. So we're optimistic about this trial, and, um, and I think um, we... Uh, we have everything lined up, ready to go. I've had a lot of help from a lot of people. One of the things, uh, the two probably critical people in the study, I'll mention Brian Kaspar has been critical in developing the preclinical findings. We also have a vector production lab in our own center where we can make the virus and make the gene, and all that's been done uh, right at home in Columbus. And so we're ready to go. And then we have people on our regulatory committee um, who do all the regulatory stuff that you saw and other people who are helping with the clinical trial. Um, and this has been a, really a major effort over the past four years, but I could not have done it, at least up to this point, without the support of the Myositis Association and without the help of many of you in the audience. So I'm really grateful to you. And I think that I hope that we can make a difference as we move forward. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Gorley, and I'm a rheumatologist. And the first thing I think that we need to do is we need to heal the healer here. And if anybody has any spare prednisone, maybe you could drop it off with Lisa afterwards. I, I need to make sure she gets home to her little one safely. Why did I get into myositis? As Lisa told you, she grew up in the world of lupus, and I grew up in the world of lupus. I'm at the National Institutes of Health, which is in Bethesda, Maryland. And at that time, I was in the laboratory, and I did clinical trials looking at lupus patients that get kidney disease. As life takes you through various turns and bends, I wound up at a different place and came back to the NIH, and I found myself working with three people who you might know. One is Dr. Paul Plotz, one is Dr. Fred Miller, and one is Dr. Lisa Ryder. 
So I had no choice. I couldn't study lupus anymore. Hence, I started following myositis. Now, in the hat that I roll, wear right now, I'm the program director for fellowship training. So it's my job to make sure that my rheumatology fellows learn about all the aspects of rheumatic disease. And I take it very, very keenly that they know all about myositis as well. And some, some people know me because they visited me, but some people know me because last year I asked, does anybody have inclusion body myositis where there are more than one person affected with it in the family? And at that point, I had a senior fellow, her name is Dr. Christine Castro, who starts to define the genetics of the disease. And we're learning a lot about people who we have been calling inclusion body myositis may actually have a form of a dystrophy. And so Christine and I are interested in finding other people who have familial forms of, of inclusion body myositis, that is they have two or more affected in the family, and we're interested in talking with you and seeing if we can learn more about what your DNA has to, to tell us about that. So that's the area of the research that I'm involved in, and I'll turn it over to the next person. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Roop Tandon, and I'm on the faculty at the University of Vermont College of Medicine. I'm a trained internist and neurologist and neuromuscular specialist. My interest in uh, myositis and muscle disease began when I was doing my fellowship with Dr. Walter Bradley, and some of you may have heard about him. He's now retired, but he um, had one of the first descriptions and classifications of the inflammatory muscle disorders. In, uh, in, in collaboration with a colleague of his called Dr. DeVere. So DeVere and Bradley's classification of inflammatory muscle disease was one that went on for many years and since then has been modified subsequently. I see a large number of patients with muscle disease, uh, not only myositis, but also muscular dystrophies in our clinic. I also am looking forward to our collaboration with uh, Dr. Todd Levine in trying to um, stratify protocols for treatment with IVIG. I use a fair amount of IVIG in different neuromuscular disorders. The third is that I work with uh, a scientific study group at Harvard in the drug development in my other area of interest, which is in Lou Gehrig's disease. And there we review the current literature in the disease, we identify the various pathways for uh, the disease, and then identify drugs that are in the, in the development stages for different pathways in the disease and stratify them based upon their significance. And I hope to be able to convince the Myositis Association to bring that strategy to drug development and myositis as well. So thank you very much for listening. So good morning, my name's uh, Dave Fiorentino and I work at Stanford University and I'm a dermatologist by training, only dermatologist here, I guess. Um, my background um, is in immunology, I actually have a PhD in immunology, but I got interested in um, myositis, specifically dermatomyositis as a resident when I was training in dermatology. And I remember the case, it was a woman uh, in her 50s and was referred to us for a drug rash and um, she felt fine other than this itchy drug rash she'd had for Oh, maybe three, four months, and um, you know, we looked at her, and the attending physician I was working with started looking at her fingers and doing all these things. I was wondering what the heck was going on, and basically made the diagnosis of dermatomyositis, um, even though the, at the patient was not weak. And as you know, many patients can have dermatomyositis spectrum of disease without having a lot of muscle disease, actually. And um, actually, and you, as you know, also may know, dermatomyositis is associated with cancer. So that particular patient underwent an ovarian ultrasound, they discovered an ovarian um, carcinoma and uh, took her ovary out, saved her life. Basically, I like to say that her rash saved her life because it was, she was trying to tell the doctor something with her skin. And I think that's the way I look at skin disease um, in two ways. One is that skin disease in and of itself in patients with dermatomyositis, as you know, can be very, very um, disabling. And people will tell you, well, that what's, wrong, what's the big deal with skin? It's not gonna kill you. Um, but, you know, it's all about the quality of your life. It's not necessarily always about life and death. And as doctors, I think that that's one of the things that we are 
here for is to improve your quality of life. And so one of the things we're interested in skin disease is trying to um, find, conduct clinical trials to understand what drugs may be effective for skin disease and dermatomyositis. And just as you've heard some of the other doctors here, that requires understanding outcomes and being able to define outcomes for what means how do we define a patient is better in terms of their skin. And so that's one of the things we've been working on for the last several years with a collaborative group in North America. And we've now, now like, I'm happy to say we have a, an instrument now that we can use to measure skin disease that's being used in clinical trials to define improvement. Um, and the second thing I do in clinic is I'm about 35% clinical in the rest of research. The, 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 the rest of the, the um, work that we do in clinic is to actually see if we can understand how the skin can tell us, as I said, tell us more about the patient, not only their skin, but their whole disease. And are there, um, are there any clues that we can get based on the skin exam that can tell patients, answer patients, those important questions like, Doc, how am I going to do, um, you know, over time? Is this going to go away? Is it going to get better? Am I going to get lung disease like some of the other patients I know um, get? Is my muscle disease going to get worse, better? And those are the kinds of questions that I think are very important. We're still at a stage, I think, where we're really trying to actually describe these diseases better and classify diseases. And so um, I think that that's my major role as a dermatologist, um, seeing patients with, with myositis. So with that, I'll turn that over to Ingrid. Thanks. So I'm Ingrid Lundberg from Karolinska Institute, Stockholm, Sweden. And my uh, interest in myositis uh, started some 20 years ago, also from a meeting of a patient. And uh, at that time, uh, we were told as uh, young clinicians that if you have inflammation in your muscle, uh, it would be dangerous to exercise. So we were uh, told, and that was also in a textbook, that patients with myositis should rest and take uh, cortisone and other drugs. But one day in my clinic, a man in his 50s with myositis came into my office and said, look, I've started to train and do exercise and I've improved. And he lay down on the floor and demonstrated how many push-ups he could do. <laughs> <laughs> so that was inspiring for me to, s to understand what actually is causing the weakness when you have myositis and also how you can improve the weakness. And the approach that we have taken in our research group is to investigate muscle biopsies uh, in the microscope and uh, from patients in different phases of the disease and um, correlate the, the molecular findings in the biopsy with the clinical outcome measures such as strength and muscle function. And we have also investigated what uh, different interventions, how they could affect the muscle, uh, both performance and the molecular expression in the muscle, <laughs> such as the effect of uh, cortisone or anti-TNF uh, uh, treatment and also exercise. And what we have learned that is that exercise is safe and can even improve your muscle performance. And uh, I will talk more about that uh, this afternoon. I'm also taking the lead in a project to develop the criteria for myositis, which is a multidisciplinary project, and we hope to have some results uh, in, the, in next year. And together with um, Dr. Vankowski and Dr. Cooper, whom you hear next, we have taken initiative to a European myositis register, where we now have more than 1,000 patients. And this register serves as a platform for uh, new clinical uh, studies and also that will facilitate uh, recruitment to clinical trials. So I think we have a lot more to do and I would like to thank you all for your participation in this conference and for your interest because that has been very inspiring me, for me as a clinician scientist. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Siri Wenzowski and I come from Czech Republic, a city of Prague. I work in the Institute of uh, Rheumatology. I am a rheumatologist. Uh, most of my time, working time is 
uh, they will do to patients uh, to, with connective tissue diseases. And since about 18 years ago, we started uh, to be interested in patients with myositis. We have now a cohort of about more than 300 patients, confirmed cases with uh, poly dermatomyositis and uh, polymyositis and dermatomyositis. And of course, we <laughs> want to contribute to assessment and better understanding and treatment of the disease. So initially, we started with uh, collaborations. We were lucky we uh, joined uh, IMAX group that uh, Chet Odis talked about uh, at the very beginning. So we participated in the development of this activity and damage uh, criteria, and we continue with the uh, collaboration. Uh, Ingrid already mentioned that in the last five, six years, we were heavily involved in autocure projects, European Union supported projects that uh, the main achievement was uh, formation of pan-European registry for patients with myositis that uh, several, many countries actually now participate and we have now even an interest out of, uh, out of Europe uh, to join this registry. And we have mainly clinical data and we are now starting to use these clinical data. In our case, we are interested in autoantibodies, so we look at some association of clinical features and prognosis. Uh, particularly antibodies that we selected is called anti-PMSCL. It's for uh, myositis and sometimes in overlap with uh, scleroderma. And also another anti antibody, NTP-155-140, uh, that we have some uh, evidence in our uh, cohort that it may be associated not only with cancer and disease, but also with the aggressivity of the cancer. And we want to use this registry to, to confirm this. We have more collaboration throughout Europe with Ingrid. We collaborate on a, a cytokine co called BAF, which, which stimulates B lymphocytes to grow, and probably it's associated with development of autoantibodies in this disease. And in our lab, we have some evidence that may be related to predispo genetic predisposition for the, for with the gene, specific gene encoding for this protein. We are also interested in uh, treatment. We participated in the RIM study that Chod Odis presented here. We uh, organized a study called Prometheus, which basically looks at uh, a treatment of patients at onset of the disease. Uh, either with prednisone alone or with prednisone and methotrexate uh, to get uh, an uh, immunosuppressive drug. So we want to answer the question whether it's beneficial to start with the more aggressive treatment from the very beginning of the disease. Uh, we are in the middle of the, of the trial. Uh, and what is the future? Uh, we have a good group in our institute that is interested in adipokines. So uh, these are cytokines produced by fat tissue and some first results, we have preliminary evidence that one of these adipokines might be in, in, uh, involved in inflammation in myositis. And second thing is that uh, we uh, were awarded by a local grant to study epigenetic changes in uh, rheumatic diseases, which include uh, myositis. So maybe we will have some answer to this in the next years. Thank you. on the podium, eh? Um, my name is Bob Cooper. I'm an adult rheumatologist from Manchester, UK. Um, I started working in myositis in 1998. Um, it was an accident, really. Uh, I'd come back to Manchester to do a full-time clinical job. I do four clinics a week, um, so the only chance of me doing any research was to link up with a pure scientist, and in Manchester, there's a fantastic genetic setup uh, with Professor Bill Ollier. So, I'd worked with Bill previously on lupus genetics, um, and uh, I went to Bill, I said, look, Bill, um, if I get you 100 samples um, from myositis patients, can we do some genetics? Um, and when I'd done the lupus research, 100 patients was enough because nobody was doing much in the way of genetics. So Bill, so things had moved on, and Bill said, well, look, if you're going to do it properly, you need 300 patients. Now, in the UK, most rheumatologists adult rheumatologists will see four or five cases in a whole career. And at that time, there was only one myositis specialist myositis clinic in the UK, and that was David Eisenberg's 
in London, and he only had 40 odd patients. So I <coughs> kind of thought, well, how the hell am I going to get 300 patients? <laughs> so, so Bill and I set up the adult onset immunogenetic collaboration. So Bill sits in his lab, uh, which meant that I had to interface and get people around the UK to send me bloods from their cases. And after about three years, um, we'd got 60 centers working with us, uh, and some DGH uh, clinicians only had five cases, and they sent me all of their cases. So in the meantime, I'd set up a tertiary clinic in, in, in Salford in Manchester. Um, and so eventually, after about three years, I had my 280 samples. And I felt pretty pleased with myself. Um, and of course, I was sending all these samples to Chet because he was our serological collaborator at that time. So, as some of you know, with regard to the antibodies, the more patients I sent to Chet, the more antibody subgroups he found. And of course, what we've shown is that um, HLA genes type very carefully for certain antibodies. So, as I got more patients, he discovered more subgroups, and I lost statistical power along the way. <laughs> so anyway, what we were able to show in those early studies was that the very close association between what antibodies you produce and what your genetic type is around HLA. And in fact, um, some of you, if you come later to hear my talk, I think I'll be able to show you evidence that if you get um, myositis, the genes that you develop will be dictated by your HLA. Um, anyway, if you want to see genes if you want to pick up important genes outside, outside of HLA, it's like sticking in it. The, the reason why we looked at HLA, of course, is that HLA is very important in rheumatoid diabetes, in other words, in all of the other autoimmune diseases. So it's very sensible for us to start at HLA, and, and we've produced some very good, uh, interesting findings. But if you want to find genes outside of HLA, then you have to do with genome-wide association studies. Now, there's been three GWASs, as they're called, in rheumatoid. And the three people that have been doing them, the three groups have now put all their patients together. And they've now got 14,000 patients with rheumatoid and 27,000 patients at uh, controls. So we've been trying to get up our patient numbers. We're now up to 750 in the UK. You heard Jiri say they're up to 350. I think Ingrid's got 150. Catalan Danko in Hungary's about, got about 400. And all this has been possible through this myositis network, European my myositis network. But even so, um, with all of that power diluted by antibody subtypes, um, we still didn't have enough to do a GWAS. So ultimately, we teamed up with Fred Miller. And even after 12 years of struggling away, we did a GWAS. And the only thing that came up as being statistically important was HLA. So now Peter Gregerson in New York was the person that uh, did the analysis and presented it at a recent uh, international myositis conference in Manchester. Uh, and after 12 years, um, we haven't got enough patients <laughs> after all that time. So, um, so I'm 58 next, and I'll be flogging away to recruit patients. I, I'm an international and national immunogenetic facilitator. Bill Olive's lab is the one that does all the, the actual analysis. Um, and we piece together these and correlate antibodies, genotype and phenotype later on. Um, so um, I'm very thankful for being here as part of the committee. Um, and uh, any of you who haven't given blood for genetic studies with your base consultant, will you pester him uh, so that within the US, at least, we can get patient numbers up? Um, on a piece of good news, um, we haven't been collaborating with many neurologists in the UK. That's, that's not by design. It's just that I, I don't know many neurologists. I only go to rheumatology meetings, so I wouldn't meet them. But recently, I've teamed up with somebody called Professor Mike Hanna, who's the, uh, he administers the uh, MRC Neuroscience Center in Queen Square in London. And he's got an active interest. He's a neurologist. And he's got an active interest in IBM. He's got 100 IBM patients. Uh, and the second part of the MRC Neuroscience Center is in Newcastle, north of England. And they've got 100 IBMs. And in Manchester, we've got about 50 with our neurologists. So pretty soon, we'll have 250 IBMs. So we'll be doing genes and antibodies. No one's ever used immunoprecipitation properly to look at a large group of IBM patients. So, so I don't know whether antibodies are important in IBM. And I don't know much about the genes and how they relate to antibodies if they're present. So the reason why I've 
said that at the end is when I come to these meetings, IBM patients will all say, Dr. Cooper, you never mention IBM. So if you come this afternoon, I'll mention it on more than a few occasions. Thank you. <laughs> I think you all can appreciate the commitment of each of the members of the Medical Advisory Board. And as you can see, we, have, we really have a broad scope and depth of specialties and an international component. And we didn't assign seats, but all three European partners decided to stay at that end of the, uh, <laughs> of the stage for some reason. But we try, uh, you know, being international in scope, obviously there's a lot of collaboration and work going on around the world related to this. It's encouraging to everybody, I'm sure, to hear uh, the level of commitment and the interesting work that is taking place. The uh, one thing I'd like to mention, then we're going to have a couple questions. Uh, some people wonder whether a medical advisory board uh, is compensated for their service. They're all volunteers. The only compensation we provide to them. Oh, okay. Sure, they appreciate it as much as we appreciate them. But the only compensation we do provide is we we pay their way to the annual conference here and and provide lodging for them. Provided dinner last night, we're going to provide a lunch today, and then they're back home. So, uh, thank you to all the members of the medical advisory board. Uh, we have sure go ahead. We have time for a few questions. Uh, there are a couple microphones out in the audience. So anyone has a question, please put their hand up. Gwenice is one up here, there, there. Uh, I haven't really heard an, a, an accurate number of the, uh, of the myositis uh, patients in the, in the world, uh, U.S. and let's say a general understanding of how many people in the U.S. have myositis. Uh, breakdown and so forth. Uh, could anybody answer that? You stumped him. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> the, uh, the Myositis Association uses a figure of 30,000 in America uh, that are pretty much confirmed cases, but we believe there's probably another 20,000 that are misdiagnosed or undiagnosed, so at least in America, we, we say 30 to 50,000. Worldwide, does anybody have any? It's probably roughly one in 10,000. One you, like in the, That would make sense. So the, probably the roughest guess, if you include all the myositis, would be about one in 10,000, because IBM's the most common. is going to be six or seven per 100,000, and add on a few more. So that would make sense with 30 to 50,000 in the US, and then divide five billion by 10,000. <laughs> Next question. Uh, this is for Dr. Mendel. How many um, patients will be in the uh, clinical trial, and how many of them will be IBM patients, and how will they be selected? Uh, the IBM trial will have nine patients. There will be a dose escalation study. There will be three at each dose uh, level, and we'll also have three. Uh, we'll have the same number of Becker muscular dystrophy patients. So. The total trial will be 18. Um, the basis for the uh, selection has to do with how much pre-exposure there's been to uh, the virus that we're using, which is adeno-associated virus, um, and there are various serotypes, and, and every one of the patients who has um, generously come to be screened and participated in this outcomes trial um, had blood drawn, and we know what their uh, pre-existing uh, immune state was. Uh, we found previously that pre-existing immunity um, causes some problems, but I will say that um, we have been looking at this in the lab extensively and not to be dissuaded by that because we can get around pre-existing immunity by plasmapheresis, um, uh, but w going into this initial trial, the FDA wants it squeaky clean and they will not let us use immunosuppression or plasmapheresis for the initial trial. So if we have success in the initial trial, we can extend it to really the group at large, and if they did have um, antibody levels to the virus, we could, uh, we have ways of dealing with that. 
Hi, this is for Dr. Levine. I have IBM. I recently got an overlap disease. I was doing very, very good before I got this overlap disease, and now I've, I've turned like 10 times worse. Is there a reason for that? <laughs> Actually, maybe more for Chet. <laughs> <laughs> I'll defer to Dr. Otis. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I mean, IBM is, is interesting in, in the sense that um, for a lot of years, we actually thought that IBM kind of stood alone. But if you look a little bit deeper into cohorts of IBM, there are other dis disorders. For example, like Sjogren's syndrome uh, is one that I, I, it's, it's somewhat anecdotal. Uh, it's not totally data driven. So I hate to stand up here and, and talk about a lot of overlap syndromes. But in essence, there are, there are other immunologically mediated d uh, diseases that can occur in patients with uh, IBM. And I, for one, have seen uh, Sjogren's syndrome and some other overlap disorders as well. So sometimes you're right. The other, uh, the other entity can overwhelm uh, another primary uh, entity. Without knowing more about your case, it's about the best I can do to answer that. I must have been sleeping the last couple of meetings because I hadn't heard of the Novartis trial and the uh, biological that's being uh, studied in IBM, uh, which we heard about today. Uh, obviously, if it's moving into phase three, there should be some exciting phase two results, but uh, I don't sense uh, a lot of excitement, or at least uh, uh, from, uh, from the folks that have been treating IBM uh, or haven't heard much about it. Uh, is this something really promising uh, that we should all be looking hard at, or, or is it, uh, and I don't know what the bi biological is, what, uh, uh, what it is, but uh, maybe Dr. Levine or Dr. Otis? Uh, so, you know, I think anytime things move into larger phase trials, there's reason to be excited, and it's certainly been a long time since there's been a multi-centered, uh, you know, controlled trial in IBM, so I think that part's exciting. I think it... It speaks to the mechanism that Dr. Mendel's working on, which is that um, if we can block myostatin, we might be able to improve muscle strength. Uh, so there are multiple centers across the country that are participating in the trial, and obviously getting involved in trials we think is a good thing to advance science. You know, whether or not it's going to work or not, we don't know. Uh, I'd have to, I don't have those actually, I'd have to go back and look at that. We weren't part of the phase two trial, but it should be available, um, they were published and it should be available through Novartis or through the website. My question is for Dr. Otis. The, the REM study, is that the results readily available to our physicians? Because I know my physician was in, at University of Miami was very interested in it and also in the, the dosing of the rituximab. You had mentioned that y'all used higher dosing um, than what's recommended, and I'd like a little more information on that. Well, first of all, this was formally presented uh, in November of 2010 in, in its first form, and um, y your doctors probably don't have all the data because it's actually under peer review at the present time. You know, this was submitted for review, and depending on the outcome of, of peers that, that look at this trial, uh, more of it will become available. Um, you know, some of it is available out there already because I've, I've talked about this trial uh, for the initial time in, uh, initially in November. Now, just in regards to the, to the dosing, um, I'll just quickly answer that. The standard dosing uh, for lymphoma and, in fact, for a lot of the immune diseases previously and even the, the dosing that uh, Dr. Levine used is the four-time weekly dose. It's actually at 375 milligram per meter squared given once a week for four consecutive weeks. Now, I, I mentioned to you that, uh, that, uh, that we used a different regimen, and, in fact, the, the drug is approved by the FDA for rheumatoid arthritis given in a similar fashion to we. Uh, to, the, to the way that we gave it, uh, essentially one gram, uh, not per meter squared, but one gram on weeks, two weeks apart, like week zero and, and, and or I'm sorry, day zero and day 14 for RA. We gave it basically, you know, one week apart, day zero, day seven, because of design issues. But Did you use any other pre-meds with that? No, we did not use corticosteroid <laughs> infusions for uh, for lots of reasons. We didn't want to obscure the uh, response that we were, you know, that we would assess. But yes, in, in the standard fashion, rituximab is given with steroids. Uh, 
Yeah, yes. Well, that's, yeah, that's for, yeah, that's a standard dose that is given for rheumatoid arthritis, for example. Uh, what about I, the very active skin? Like my doctor, Dr. Yurizzo, is, you know, we're doing it 1,000 and then two weeks later, 1,000. Now you're saying you do it 375 milligrams? No, no I, I said that there's one regimen that's four consecutive weeks, 375 milligram per meter squared. So it's variable depending on the size of the individual. That's okay. one way to give it. But in rheumatology, for, for the most part, it's, it's given, I shouldn't say for the most part, but a common way for, for RA, which is FDA approved, is to give two doses, the one gram dose, much like you got it, two weeks right. apart. Okay, thank you. Uh, it sounded like enrollment in the follistatin study was completed, even though it's not, uh, the study hasn't started. Uh, what about enrollment in the Novartis study? Uh, no, there's, they're still enrolling. So I think the study's either just begun or, uh, but the definitely sites that are still enrolling. For Dr. Pestron, I believe, um, last year a number of us at the conference participated in what we called the SPIT study. <laughs> I'm sure you had a bit more technical term for it than that, but um, can you tell us anything about what's happened since a year ago? So since a year ago, all the, a, a number of people participated in a study where you spit into a cup and we took your, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we took your samples back to the lab and have isolated the, the DNA. And, and uh, as uh, Dr. Cooper mentioned, you need very large numbers of, of those kinds of, of, of samples to, to uh, um, provide adequate uh, an analysis. And so, um, like him, we're continuing to, to, to collect those samples. Um, one of the things that we uh, are using those samples for is as controls for patients who have hereditary inclusion body myopathy um, uh, disorders, looking for specific genes that cause those. But, but at, at, at this point, we, we have about um, 150 to 200 inclusion body myositis DNA samples, and maybe we can collaborate with Dr. Cooper at some point to um, get a large enough number to generate useful information. Uh, Dr. Time for one more question, I think. Dr. Vankowski, um, did I understand that you're asking for people to give blood for your research? Well, no, no, not immediately. I mean, uh, we. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, we we do different research, and we usually have the blood that we have is from our patients that we have, and in Prague. And if we need more blood, we collaborate so far within Europe with other centers throughout the registry where we have the clinical data, but also uh, the blood and uh, serum derived from the blood is uh, stored. So uh, I cannot answer yes at the moment. Please come and give us the blood. But uh, uh, but on the other hand, Bob Cooper. Uh, stress that uh, it's for certain studies like uh, genetic studies it's very good if we have enough sufficient numbers of patients otherwise uh, particular with genetic studies we cannot get the the power for to, to calculate the real results okay one last question right there well, while the microphone goes over there, as you know, uh, almost all the panelists are going to be presenting this afternoon on individual topics. You'll have a chance to talk to them further there. And uh, last question. Talking about genetics, uh, with a quick peek in the slides, I realize maybe I missed, I don't know, uh, the, the states with more, with high Hispanic population, they are marked like they have high rate of myositis. Like I said, Florida, Texas, Illinois, maybe I didn't see good, but I realized that it's some uh, etnia that has, that carry that uh, gene in high levels. Uh, 
if, if I understand the, the question, is myositis increased in, in Hispanics in some regions? And I think uh, Raju's data <clears throat> was looking at exposure to ultraviolet light in states that are in the southern hemisphere versus the northern hemisphere, there's a higher incidence. More patients tend to have a dermatomyositis than polymyositis. Is that what you were trying to get at? Yes, thank you. Just one quick public service or shameless plug. We have the second annual myositis walk for a cure. Anybody in the Maryland <coughs> DC area in Centennial Park uh, in Ellicott City, Maryland on October 15th. We actually should have flyers out at the desk out there if you're interested. It's a walk to benefit both the Myositis Association and our center. Last year we had our first walk. It was very successful. Love to see the support of anybody or your relatives. Anybody would love to come out and support us. We would love to have you. So that's October 15th and there'll be a little flyer at the desk, at the registration desk. Thank you. All right. Thanks to everybody. Lunch is in the room behind us at Vista Ballroom, and uh, we'll see you later. <laughs>